Speak, a platform where artisans get to talk candidly about their work in the arts and also weigh in on some of the creative industry's biggest issues today. My name is Jennifer DeMarco. I'm a novelist, playwright, poet, filmmaker, core mechanic, designer for games, and a musician. Today, I am speaking with Lauren Patzer, who is the author of From the Shadows and Dissonance Junction, among other works. Lauren, thank you for joining us on Speak today. You are welcome. So, before we dive in too far, and before we really tackle any of like the big creative industry issues, I want to talk about your work. Right. Before someone reads anything you've written, mm -hmm. and I know that you have the ResTap books, mm -hmm. and they're under a pen name, and yeah. we'll talk about that in a second, but you also have Dissonance Junction and From the Shadows, which are both short story collections. Now, our regular viewers of Speak already know about the Trinity Project okay. from many different perspectives. Now, it was Dissidence Junction that was your Trinity Project stories. Correct. So you got a prompt every month for a year, you wrote those stories, and they were compiled together. Yes. But From the Shadows are no prompt, no project, just you. Yes. And then you also have a short story in Unnerving, mm -hmm. and you have a Blue Flash edition, uh, Immortal. Immortal, your story in Unnerving, From the Shadows, Dissident Junction, all horror thriller suspense? Yes, that's fair enough. So okay. Yes. And what, if I said, what is Lauren Patzer 101? <laughs> what should people know before they dive in to your horror stories? What should they know about you? What should they know about your style? What would you say? Um, I like to be a little bit all over the place. <laughs> so, um... If you you read some of the horror stories, some of the horrors are dy uh, dystopian science fiction. Some of them are straight up horror, you know, uh, bodies dysmorphia, uh, uh, critter stories. You know, yeah. I mean, they're they're kind of run the gamut uh, mm -hmm. in the same way that from the short stories I like to write all over kind of run the gamut. Yeah. So I do have the you know the horror side of me, but also the you know the science fiction comedy side of me. Yeah, the res taps right. are definitely sci fi comedy. Yeah. Yeah. But. Um, uh, there, there are little, there are little pieces of my brain mm -hmm. uh, that you get to see uh, uh, come out. Uh, some of that stuff is from. I'm, I'm not going to say that the I've chronicled a dream, mm -hmm. but I will say for a lot of those, there are little pieces of things that came from a dream or a nightmare, mm. uh, and I just I latched onto that and I said, well, that's interesting, uh, and then mm -hmm. you know, kind of expand upon that. Mm -hmm. Now, Distant Junction was a little bit different, uh, the Trinity stories because yeah. Now I'm 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 thinking up the story right as I'm you give me a prompt mm -hmm. and now you're getting like a, it's almost like hot wire yeah into my psyche saying okay boom what does that make me think about okay you know so instead of a you know a dream that I kind of ruminated about or so mm -hmm. on and so forth uh, that's a little bit more a little bit more personal a little bit more you know uh, I don't know I guess you get a little bit more inside of me with the distance junction. Yeah, stories than you do with the uh, the horror, the straight up horror. And in terms of just the kind of the chronological timeline of the writing, the Res Taps, at least these three were written first, and then you did the Trinity Project, and then From the Shadows. Is that true? That is correct. And did you know going into the Distant Junction stories, the Trinity Project stories, mm -hmm. that you weren't going to do sci-fi comedy? Where you're like, no, that's just Res Tap. I've always wanted to write horror thriller. Yes. Yes, oh. because now this is under under my name. Yes, right. So it's not under the pen name. True. Um, and so I I kind of created a separate persona for the the science fiction horror. Yeah. So he's a little bit more you know snooty and you know yeah. you, you know not not horribly snooty, but I mean just mm -hmm. you know kind of you know in, a little bit in your face and a little bit you know snooty and and, and funny, um, and and this is just me, you know. Mm -hmm. So a little bit more natural. Um, and part of that is because now I did, uh, you know, I went to book conferences and, 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 and um, uh, things like that with, as Artemis Withers, and, you know, I'd wear a, uh, an outfit, a suit, and, and yeah. whatnot, and, you know, and then special, you know, I had sunglasses that I wore, you know, yeah. and I wound up not, finally not wearing them inside because I couldn't see a thing. Uh, <laughs> but they're part of the. If, if you look at the picture on the back, it's, that's you know what I did, and I, yeah. so I wore that suit all the time. And a persona, you that, created yeah, this so persona. I created a yeah. persona for that. And uh, when I wanted to do you know the other writings, I was like, you know, I don't want to. I want it just to be me. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just me. 
<laughs> and I think actually that's a that's a great entry point to actually say. And I know what you're saying about you know you say snooty. It's like I people say tell me about Red Tap, and I say um, action adventure comedy sci fi campy. But then I always back up and I'm like no no, no not campy like not campy like um, uh, the Orville. Right. Campy like oh gosh boy this is gonna date me like mm-hmm. Barbarella. Oh, That's wow. how I okay. see it. I mean, just yeah. for me. I mean, not Barbarella for bros. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, but yeah, even though yeah. it isn't Barbarella for bros, yeah, so yeah, I mean, yeah. that's kind of a point there. But I always saw it as like the Res Taps remind me so much of some of the classic sci-fi like Lost in Space, mm-hmm. um, Barbarella, um, very like original series Star Trek, but it's funnier than that. Right. Uh, well. Yeah. It's intentionally funnier mm-hmm. than that. Yes. Um, <laughs> And whereas your horror work, I'm like, this is like, it truly is. This is a completely different person. (laughs) I didn't know. know, If you hadn't said, oh, here, here's my res taps. Publish these res taps. Before you had done the Trinity Project, I never would have guessed this was the same author. You know, because people say, well, but it's the same style, right? I'm like, no, no. No. Now I have to jump to this before we go on. Okay. When you're writing a res tap, Mm -hmm. do you, this is going to sound strange, but do you write in persona? Or is it just like on the page, you craft it, but you're very much you. So I'm, I'm very much me, and the reason, the reason I guess those, those characters came from a different place. Yeah, Probably, okay. I think, at a different time, really, you know. I mean, uh, it's 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Oh, maybe I didn't know it had longer. been that long. Well, that the, the idea came up yes. for the things. And I, I will get, we'll give you a we'll give you a real deep dive on this tap for just a moment. Yeah, no, please do. Let's do that now because then I want to really <laughs> explore Lauren Patzer for the interview. But talk to me so about Rest Tap. Rest Tap came from seventh grade. Oh, fantastic! When my best friend oh my gosh. looked at me and he said, "You know, your last name backwards is Rest Tap." And that was it. That was all I needed. That little kernel just grew and grew and grew over time. You know, one, there's the little warning sign for uh, um, the, the Android thing. Uh, that came from a book cover I did, had in high school. Um, and so, I mean, it just um, so it's just grown. And, and if, you'll, if you look into the, the Rez tab, and especially Mishaps and Mayhem, yeah. there are little, the, the, little Easter eggs of stuff from the past, mm-hmm. like um, the little robot that uh, follows Gorth around on the mining planet when he's yeah. nine years old. Yeah. That's based off the uh, the Mach 5 in Speed Racer. If you <laughs> if you notice, he's a Mark 5 nanny robot. Oh, I love that. Well, I mean, <laughs> and he's got I'm the same colors as the car. Eggs. Oh my gosh, <laughs> yes. So... Yeah, so they're—I mean—they're—they're they're sprinkled up throughout, okay. and yeah, some people recognize them, some people won't, but right. they're just fun little things. So it doesn't—it doesn't affect how the story, you know, goes. It's just little things I put in there to, to have fun with. I think that you know, it's that idea—a little germ, that little seed, that little beginning—has mm-hmm. come up in previous episodes of Speak, and I love the fact that so many of us working particularly I think in in print but I think in all creative industries yeah. you know we're kind of like I took this this one little thing it was um a woman in a red dress and that became you know uh you know Cylon number six or you know what you know whatever it was right, right, right. um I love how the creative brain will take those little seeds and completely build off those I mean plant them I guess we could just stay with that mm-hmm. analogy we plant that seed and suddenly we have this massive tree that we can build an entire world in. Now it's like a Holt tree. Now it's elf quest. Um, (laughs) So the idea, the word res tap was from seventh grade. Did you start to think about the world, the characters, the style? I'm trying to think of seventh grade. How old was I in seventh grade? What year was seventh grade? Um, 13. 13. So Star Wars, Star Wars had come out Mm -hmm. already. And Res Tap is kind of an homage to Star Wars and space opera. Yeah. Um, and I think it was probably shortly after Star Wars came out that that melded in my mind, saying, oh, you know, I could take this, you know, a different direction. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And I think that's kind of how my mind works with stories I can in see general. Star Wars. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see. Now that you say it, I can see. Yeah, it. yeah, yeah. Because yeah. there's a princess rescue story. Y- yeah. That goes, that goes horribly wrong. And similar to Star Wars. Yeah. But in a different yes. way. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so um, that's and that was the that was the and that was the germ of the stories around Rose Tap. Yeah. Um, and the character was just kind of just jumbled around there until. Um, and I had a, a, a friend who I grew up with. You know, he was uh, an African American. He still is. <laughs> um, Surprise! And, uh, but what's neat is he actually moved up here. So oh. he's up in he's in uh, Everett, I think. Okay. Uh, but uh, I had not gotten together with him yet. Uh-huh. But uh, it was it was kind of neat that I just based a Gorth on him. Yeah. Um, just because I was like, you know, I need I need somebody who's who's a little bit because Rest Ham's silly. Especially at the beginning. Yes. Now, now he'll grow and, and, and mature and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. Uh, and his friend Gorth is you know, much more serious and uh, uh, the, the 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 sturdy person of the of the pair. Yeah. Um, and does I've your or- friend know? He does. He does know. He That's does cool. know. And he's okay. he's kind of tickled. Um, <laughs> but uh, but and this dynamic though was, you know, I had trouble with Restap doing it originally, because mm-hmm. um, I I wrote it. You know, third person and so on and so forth. Yeah. Originally, uh, and then you know, I was going through. I was like, well, I mean, it's okay. And then and this is where it's so important to read, read, because I said I I picked up Sherlock Holmes and I was reading it and I was like, hey, this is it. Yeah, <laughs> it needs to be told from Watson's point of view, which all the Sherlock Holmes is, is done from Watson's point of view. Yes. And then I said, that's it. I need to do, tell this from Gorth's point of view. And so that's... So I had to go back and rewrite... Yeah. ...the entire book. Yes. Uh, that's where I learned the value of an editor, because mm-hmm. the first time I self-published mm-hmm. Rest Tab, mm-hmm. uh, I did not have an editor. Mm-hmm. And it was not good. <laughs> well, I mean, I just... I think that it's it's just one of those things where y- you love it so much, and so much of it is in your head. Yes. That that's it. I you know I always say I have no problem with people self publishing. As a matter of fact, I wish I could say everyone should self publish once. Yeah. You know, <laughs> just to be, learn. Just to learn. Just Ooh, to appreciate yeah. at least either appreciate how much work it is to do it right, or appreciate mm-hmm. how much work it is to do it wrong. Uh-huh. <laughs> either way, but it is such an incredible learning experience. Yes. Um, but. That would be hard, you know, yeah. to take it from you said third person yeah. to take it from third, and and, can, and to not miss anything. No, nah. that, no, that is exactly correct. Yeah, I it, missed many things. Yeah, no, I, <laughs> I had a um, I sent it to a friend of mine who's also an author mm-hmm. uh, in Colorado, uh, and he said, you know, I was reading through it, and after I got to the the hundred twenty seventh error, I said, I I can't do this. <laughs> I said, oh wow. my gosh. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, um, that was, but that was good. I mean, that was a good learning experience. I was yes. like, okay, editors are important. Yeah. Editors are important, kids. Okay. Um, <laughs> and Brianne loves you for saying that. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it was, a, it was a fun experience. But, I mean, I mean you know, Sherlock and Holmes, Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes, uh, and, and Doctor Watson. That mm-hmm. was the, the the impetus for how I told the stories. Yeah. Um, uh, clearly, uh, uh, Tar is no Sherlock Holmes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Gorth may be a Doctor Watson. Yeah. Very, very close to Doctor Watson. Uh, Tar is not a, not a Sherlock Holmes. Um, but uh, great fun and. I, what I like about this is being able to tell this story over multiple books, and as the, the as the as the characters mature and change yeah. and grow and whatnot. I mean, Gorth seems to be a pretty together guy at the beginning of uh, 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 Res Tap, and even in in, in many mishaps and mayhem. Mm-hmm. But you know, he's got things he needs to learn about life as well, and, and yeah. those are those are things he you definitely see him hit upon those in uh, in Saint Moth. And you're still writing in this universe. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Still, yeah. Struggling to, but yes. Oh. I'm sorry. Well, let me back it's okay. Very good. Perfect <laughs> just as it is. No uh, worries. It's, it's not, it's not the, the, the stories. It's more of a, um, a writing. I, I'm now, with the, with the pandemic and yeah. all this stuff, yeah. uh, uh, depression has hit a lot of people that maybe haven't felt it before. Yeah. 
and don't know exactly how to deal with it and how to... Well, some of them can't just pull themselves out of it. I mean, there's... I think a lot of people don't even know what they're feeling. They don't know. Like, what is this? Why can't I... Why do I not even want to get up today? You know, is what I'll hear people say. I don't understand yeah. why... Yeah. Honey, that's depression. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that's... I just I just broke through that. Like, in the last two weeks. Uh, <laughs> so... And so this... And so I'm writing another book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know if you've seen the, the post or whatever... So for NaNoWriMo, mm-hmm. I said, okay, uh, you know, I, so I, just before NaNoWriMo, I sat down and wrote a, a 20 page uh, plot summary for a horror novel. Mm-hmm. And I said, okay, uh, oh, it's happening. It's, wow. it's I'm, yeah. I'm, 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 get, I'm getting there. Um, the, the part of the journey for that was, okay, recognizing, okay, there's some depression things going on here. Mm-hmm. Um, I went and got to Holy Basil. And you know, put that in my you know coffee in the yeah. morning. And, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't want to go. You know, there's there uh, as as therapeutic and wonderful as uh, uh, marijuana is. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I there's there's several reasons I don't go that path. And um, I, I will throw in at this point, as I have in another speech interview <laughs> this week. Uh, marijuana is legal here in Washington. We are in Washington, so it's legal um, in many states. Now, yes, so, it is legal in many yeah. states, but we are in Washington right now. And Lauren is 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 twenty one or older, so yes. please use responsibly. But no, I mean, um, as a matter of just yesterday, during mm-hmm. yesterday's interview, uh-huh. the kind of the recurring theme was everyone's path to healing is different. Yeah. So uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've I've always had um, just for medications and and and, and alcohol. Yeah. And things in general. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes it's it, it's nice to to have a drink or two every once in a while, mm-hmm. but I don't like to drink to the point or take any medications that change me. Mm-hmm. So that's I I don't like to be out of control. Yeah. You know. Well, if that and unsettles I, you more than what does. you're dealing with. Then, <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's not therapeutic at all. Right. Um, but uh, but the holy basil. Um, I guess it helped. Yeah, it didn't. I didn't feel, I didn't feel an immediate change or anything like that. No. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not, I'm not going to go back and have it again. Mm-hmm. It was, it was okay. It was just, you know, a little. It was like a sweet additive that you put in your coffee. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, just thirty drops in the morning. Mm-hmm. You know, you do that twice a day if you want. Well, you know, I say was, fantastic. Yeah, if you're was, writing, then fantastic. Yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> it worked. I don't care it if you worked. grabbed well, a, a hat how, and you know, held it above your head there. and did a little dance. I don't, you know, whatever it was. <laughs> you know, you decided to go into an intensive three-hour-a-day therapy. Yeah. Whatever it was. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's fantastic. And that's and that's, and that's that's the thing is, I mean, there's, I think, a, a lot of people don't realize what life has wrought on them. Yes. Uh, and so uh, they don't recognize that what they're dealing with is depression yeah. and, and that's what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so I, I started writing again and I'm uh, NaNoWriMo now. I've, uh, what, 6,500 words? So NaNoWriMo is a national novel writing month. Just in case folks yes. don't know. <laughs> no, 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 and no. Uh, if you want to know even more about it, I, I will have to pitch this, is that we actually, Blue Forge Films mm-hmm. has a documentary about NaNoWriMo that is free to watch the entire month of November. Yep. So if folks want to know a little bit more, or just Google it, because there are millions of people yep. right now. Yep, NaNoWriMo.org. You can yeah. go sign up and get, get started. And they want. are a nonprofit, they so a non-profit. that is a fantastic thing. It costs yeah. nothing to participate. Yep. And... Uh, I think that's great. It's good stuff. Yeah. So it just kind of so it just kind of kept me on the. So I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm going to do Nano Ryo because I want to. Don't want to lose this. Yes. You know? <laughs> no. One hundred percent. Yeah. So yeah. So I've been. Uh, um, so that was right your along. way of telling me that. <laughs> your next ResTap book. Mm-hmm. Is on hold for right now because it's you're on working on a horror novel. I'm working on a horror novel. Fantastic yes. news. Now the good thing is, oh, that's I mean, a part, good thing. Well, that, well, part of that good thing is what what kind of got me to that point was I sat down because I've written like half of the next novel. Yeah. Uh, in the rest half series, uh, but I did that two nano rhymes ago, <laughs> uh, and then I and then I put it down. And I haven't haven't touched it since. Yeah. Um, I tried to get into that this summer as I told you hey you know I'd really like to get this done yeah I was gonna say I think it's, we, yeah, it's a loose it's a it. loose 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 goal and boy it, it it was very loose uh, 
stuff. Well, but uh, yeah, I said yeah. okay. If if it's not happening, it's not happening. Um, and it was and it was just writing in general that wasn't happening. So right. Um, now that that's, I feel like that's back on track, and and, mm-hmm. and maybe we've got some good places to go. But yeah, so yeah, I've got um, I've got horror back on the back on track. That's fantastic. So now talk to me a little bit, um, mm-hmm. just because I've been you know I've been trying to touch on this if it seems natural. Your writing routine. My writing routine. Do you write? <laughs> this is the point where I need to yours? drink some coffee. <laughs> It's just your honesty. I appreciate it, Lauren. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm hoping I'm not going to embarrass you a little bit. Before the cameras were rolling, uh, I asked Lauren to sign some books for Brienne because these are author... I'm not, I always say that. These are office copies. And uh, Lauren said, you know, I forgot a pen. I know you told everybody to bring a pen, but I forgot. I'm like, thank you. I will get you a pen. Thank you for just saying this. Well, oh, oh, Lord. I'm sure I had a pen here. I knew I was supposed to bring one. Um so yeah. obviously you do experience writer's block mm-hmm. and when you write do you write like only oh i'm inspired i'm gonna go is it set times do you write at different at night only you know and so, how do you write yes. computer okay. typewriter so uh the way i i kind of brainstorm and get my creative juices flowing that 20 pages is handwritten that 20 page pl- uh, plot summary um so your breakthrough moment was break, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so okay. I, that, that's 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 how that works. Um, and then uh, when I when I sit down and say, okay, I need to be serious about this, then I sit down at the computer and, and I do it. Mm-hmm. Um, how and when I write, uh, when it's possible. <laughs> oh, no. So that's... I've got you know home life is. I mean, I've got a full time job during the day. Right. But don't write during that. Right. Um, and then I've got you know. There's, there's the evening and there's, you know, I'm my lovely wife mm-hmm. uh, and my grandson typically is there. Mm-hmm. And so there are activities happening and it's not a good mind space for me to be writing. Well, and they're only little ones. Yeah. I hate little to little be a stereotypical, ones. you know, but they're only little ones. Uh, so. Sometimes I sit down and play Minecraft with him and mm-hmm. uh, that kind of stuff. And I, yeah, you're exactly right. I'm, I'm, I'm not of the mind going like, okay, I need to write heck with the kid. The kid. Yeah. Uh, it's like, no, uh, I'll be taking... Oh, oh, <laughs> Prioritizing him yeah. over over that writing yeah. time, but he's only there till like seven eight o'clock, mm-hmm. uh, and then uh, you know uh, then I've got the rest of the evening uh, uh, to do what I can with whatever energy I have left, as it were. So um, it's it's typically at night. Mm-hmm. Um, I typically have uh, these. I've got these Bose headphones. What an extravagance! They were expensive, three hundred bucks yeah. for a set of headphones is a lot. Yeah, but they're noise canceling. Bluetooth, I put them on, uh, get my iMac uh, running some music for me, mm-hmm. and then I'm writing on the PC. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, which, it's a very low-powered PC. Mm-hmm. I bought it I bought it specifically for that. I bought it so I wouldn't be playing games on it. So so there's, you can't, I can't play games on it. Mm-hmm. I can, I can, I, yeah, I can surf the internet, which, I mean, that, you know, does some, kills some time. But, Surfing the internet's also a tool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which, which I need. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> but um, that's that's kind of my process. I'll, I'll I'll sit down and put the headphones on, get mm-hmm. some music going, depending on what I'm writing, mm-hmm. uh, and then and then and go to it and writing on there. Um, to, uh, I would say weeknights if I can. Uh, weekends also if I can because mm-hmm. there are other things going on on the weekends yeah um, like you know tonight I've got this going on right yes this is a Sunday night right <laughs> yes now. this is a Sunday night right now um, and then uh, next Sunday night I've got a movie premiere I'm going to cool uh, for Ed so that, that for, for a movie I'm, I'm in fantastic so yes nice. you are also yeah, an actor also yes. an actor yep um, and then that's so and, and then you know my wife's like, okay, it's a weekend. We don't have the grandson. Let's go do the things. And it's like, okay, well, there we are. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, and yeah. again, I, I really do appreciate your honesty yeah. because I'm in the that, that NaNoWriMo documentary. It was yeah. interesting because, you know, they, um, the whole frame that we used was, you know, Brianne and I actually you know, had a little thing where we talked at the beginning about what we expected to come out of um, the process of these number of authors, you know, going through NaNoWriMo and, and vlogging about it. And then at the end, you know, we talk about what that outcome was. And I just, my head was so swollen for so many days because in the beginning I had thought so strongly, 
I don't think, oh, I'm sorry. NaNoWriMo, for those of you guys who don't know, the goal is to hit 50,000 words because 50,000 words are more used to be the hard and fast rule. If it wasn't 50,000 words or more, it was not actually a novel. It was a novella. Now, that is not the case in the publishing industry anymore. No, There's all kinds of... Fluid. Yeah. <laughs> it it depends, on, on, depends on genre and all yes, that stuff. Yes, and publisher yes. and yeah. format. and But anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, and my feeling had been if someone had a full-time job or they were raising kiddos or helping raise kiddos, mm-hmm. that they were not going to hit 50,000 words in 30 days. Yeah. And by and large, that is, that, but not across the board, but by and large, that is what came of it. Mm-hmm. So I appreciate you saying that because I think a lot of people need to hear that, yeah. is that life takes time. Yeah. Relationships take time. Mm-hmm. Not just relationships with grandsons, but with significant others. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, yes, day jobs take time. How many times have I thrown (laughs) up my hands and said, well, I wrote 20,000 words this week. (laughs) None of it for me. (laughs) But all my work is done. You know, so so I I think that's very fair. Speaking of the industry, what a fantastic segue. (laughs) So for each season of Speak, we like to ask one or two of the same questions about the creative industry to each of the artisans who come on. Okay. I don't feel like I honestly want to really push this. There's no right or wrong answer. I would just like to see how people feel about these. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, again and again, we hear the online stores, I mean, you know, let's not, next words, Amazon, Mm -hmm. is killing the bricks and mortar stores. And I say bricks and mortar because I don't like to call them real world stores because I'm like, you guys, it's all real world world. stores. Mm -hmm. Are online booksellers just the evolution of the industry? Is there any solution that will allow people to browse everything from New York Times bestsellers to independent and niche and even Mm -hmm. self-published publications? And when you go to buy a book that you want to read, where do you buy from? Will you weigh in on that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my personal feed, I, I love the brick and mortar stores. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just wandering through uh, the aisles uh, gives me inspiration mm-hmm. for writing the smell of the books. Uh, you know, it's uh, there's nothing quite like that. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll go, you know, into the you know, science fiction or, or, or the horror, you know, sections and look and say, you know, oh, they, oh yeah, this is good, and th- these are great, and then, uh, oh, 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 that's a great idea. And then, you know, so th- it's, it's not just inspiration, it's ideas, it's, yeah. it's um, uh, reinforcing uh, my love of books and writing. Because reading is, uh, well, reading is fundamental. Um, yeah, but no, it's, absolutely. It's one of the growth points for your brain is to be able to read and absorb other people's ideas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that they can kind of uh, uh, meld and inform uh, what's going on in your own head. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have nothing to go on from, if you have no outside input, it's hard to grow beyond a, a very limited, you know, perspective. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so read. I lo- so I love reading. Uh, I love, for me, picking up a book and 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 feeling the physical book mm-hmm. is uh, it's huge. Um, I, I I prefer reading. This way, you know, yeah. with with a book in hand, uh, the the printed page. Um, that's not to say I haven't written read uh, ebooks. Mm-hmm. I've read them before. I find them a little bit more difficult to absorb for mm-hmm. some reason. Uh, just uh, and, and that just may be me because I mean I grew up without reading stuff on a screen. Right. Sure. So that's today's fair. today's uh, uh, kids uh, and generation. That may be that may be the way that they are used to observing. Yeah, why do you want me to read on a piece what you of want paper? To read? Yeah, right, exactly. So, um, as as the world evolves, I think the the, the printed medium, printed books or whatever, mm-hmm. they're that's going to transition as well. Um, you're still going to have uh, uh, the folks who want to have a book in their hand. Mm-hmm. Um, you're still going to have a need for. People will still want a physical bookstore they can walk into. Mm-hmm. Only now, that's just going to be you know the few retailers we have left uh, with the and, and some of the used bookstores. Yes, uh, I, I I love going through those as well. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And the reason I love going through those is now I'm going through history. Yes. And now I'm seeing what people thought was, you know, what was groundbreaking, you know, in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you know. Mm -hmm. And and so I can I can I can time travel. Yeah. Uh, back to that point in time in literature and look and see what was interesting. Uh, and some of it I find interesting, and some of it I'm like, oh, I don't know why people like this. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. But that's personal preference and, and, and just interesting. So just, uh, I, I just enjoy that ability to just go walk through and just see different things. I have to say you're the first person mm-hmm. so far on Speak to talk about used bookstores. And boy, mm-hmm. I agree with you there. Yeah. I don't actually care for... Um, what do we call them? Not used bookstores? New, <laughs> new book bookstores? Yeah, new, new bookstores? Personally, I might yeah. be the only author on the planet who doesn't, but I think mm-hmm. I'm... There's something about the fact that I don't like walking into bookstores and not being able to find what I want if I'm going there. <laughs> and yeah. I feel like what is on the shelves is so curated. Oh, yeah. And, very limited. And I'm like, there are classics that are not here. Uh, there are, you know, canonical works that are just... They're mm-hmm. not here because there's just not enough room. Yeah. And yet, I'm also seeing... So few. I mean, I'm even seeing less, uh, like St. Martin's. You know, some of the. Yeah. Uh, it always stuns me, but a used bookstore. Yeah. People say, "Oh no, authors hate used bookstores." I'm like, "Oh, absolutely not." <laughs> and it's funny because it's not just the fiction, but it's the nonfiction too. I love mm-hmm. picking up a book like on space, from the nineteen even even the nineteen eighties or the nineteen nineties, and go, "Oh, fascinating." My most delightful purchase was about. Two Four years ago, yeah, I picked up a, a, a Cosmos by Carl Sagan. Oh, a physical you. edition of that, and I was like, oh, you know, yeah, that was fifth grade, sixth mm-hmm. grade, you know, for me. And mm-hmm. I had a friend who walked around with a copy of that book. He was a yeah, uh, just the nerd's nerd. I, I, I loved him dearly, uh, but uh, I, you know, he he just couldn't go on, you know, couldn't stop talking about it. And I, of course, I couldn't. I was at that point in time, I couldn't afford to. To buy that extravagant a book, sure. Um, but you know, now I can. I, you know, I've opened it up and I, you know, mm-hmm. look beautiful pictures and, and and interesting word things about you know, you know, space and whatnot. And uh, and some of it's dated. I mean, some of it's uh, you know, our space yes. science changes. Things our understanding changes. That's my favorite thing and though so, about it. It's like a, walking into a used bookstore is walking onto an archaeological site. Yeah. And. Hours. <laughs> hours. Hours. Well, and also, I feel like there's no pressure. I know I'm not mm-hmm. going to be disappointed because a used bookstore, by the nature of what it is, is not going to have everything I'm looking for. Right. But I'm going to find so many things I didn't know I needed. Didn't, yep. You know? Yep, yep, yep. yep. But, so hmm. that was that was, a, that was a part of the fun of one of the, uh, the things we had uh, outside the uh, book of. Yes. Yes. That's, yes. Uh, Lauren ha- participated many times. In a uh, weekly book fair outside Bookham Bookstore in Port Orchard, Washington, which is a tiny little bookstore in the tiny little town where we're located, where Blue Legacy is located. But yeah, I love that. People said, really? You're selling, you're having a book fair about new books from an independent publisher outside a used bookstore. And I'm like, yes. Sold book? Yes. (laughs) Yes. How is this not the connection? Sold books. (laughs) No. The next, the next industry issue that I ask people to weigh in on is this mm-hmm. idea of 600,000, more than half a million books in America alone mm-hmm. are published every year. Now, self-published, independent, corporate, mm-hmm. whatever it is. How do you distinguish yourself? But I have to embarrass you just a little tiny bit, mm-hmm. just a little tiny bit, because I feel like I know one of the ways that you distinguish yourself, and I believe mm-hmm. you are the only author Mm-hmm. In our current catalog, who does this? You're on TikTok. I am on TikTok, yeah. And I think that distinguishes you. <laughs> and because yeah. you're not... Oh, no, there he is. There's the squirrel in the walls. <laughs> um, because you're not 16. Yeah. Even though I shouldn't say that anymore. That's yeah. actually ignorant for someone to say. Because, oh, I've talked, um, I'm, there's, there's people older than that. Yeah, right. Yeah, so, absolutely. you know, it's really not about... It's not about just kids and, yeah. or teens anymore. Yeah. But... How do authors distinguish? That's a lot of books. That's a lot of content, Lauren. Yeah. And yeah. how can bookstores deal with that amount of content? I know there's no easy answer here, but will you weigh in on that? Well, that's that's part of the evolution. 
mm-hmm. you know, in the in with the in, way it has become easier to publish. Yeah. Uh, there's also well, I have you have to deal with that volume, and then you have to go electronic to be able to make that stuff accessible. Yeah. Um, there's just no way to do that in a physical bookstore, mm-hmm. um, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, because it would just be too expensive to have a building that big. Yeah. Uh, and then you would you would get lost trying to you know I I don't want to sprain an ankle trying to get to the you know science fiction section at the back of the store when it's half a mile away <laughs> you know so um, but yeah so so I think maybe maybe part of the thing with with Amazon is they they saw an opportunity mm-hmm. and maybe saw a little bit of the future um, absolutely. Like, well, people are going to be getting, this is how people are going to, this is, well, the internet is the future. Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people glommed onto that mm-hmm. initially. And the people who did and may have built their business around that, mm-hmm. they're the ones who are at the top of the game right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of authors uh, understand it and, and they've, em- they've embraced it for the most part. Yeah. Uh, not, not all of them, but some of them, you know, most of them have embraced it. They use that as another tool in their arsenal. Mm-hmm. You know, they do they do Amazon, uh, 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 Barnes and Noble has mm-hmm. an, a, an ebook you yeah. know, uh, uh, yep. site as well. Uh, um, isn't there, there a device, the Nook? The Nook, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of uh, uh, ebook aggregators out there as well. I mean, there are, there are many yeah. places that a, a, a self publishing or a publisher can go through to uh, do things. Ingram. Ingram. Ingram has its own yeah. self-publishing arm now. Actually, yes. uh, somebody recently said to me, mm. so does Random House. Oh, wow. Neat. So, yeah. So they're following that trend. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I mean, it's just, it's it's a tool to allow people to, to share things. And yeah. some of those people, maybe before the this electronic medium came along, mm-hmm. It was outside of their understanding on how they could share their ideas and their stories and so on and so forth. Yeah. They had a book, but they'd heard how hard it was to publish a book, and so they never tried. Mm-hmm. Now that has opened up for them. Yeah. And so the industry is more accessible. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, now that doesn't mean everything that's published out there is <laughs> is wonderful to read, <laughs> but uh, there there are. Um, well, not everyone knows the lesson that. Yeah. About yes. how important an editor is. <laughs> that is very true. That is and, so and again, true. and you know what? I mean, you yeah. and I are laughing about that, but I mean, I think what Laura and I are really talking about here is we're not talking about an editor who rewrites your work and turns it into something else. We're talking yeah. about someone who catches the typos, someone who catches the continuity errors, yes. um, things like that, that other set of eyes, and someone who's going to be honest with you to say, you know, are we supposed to like this character? Because... Yeah the character kind of isn't likable. You know, we kind of need an in. Yeah. Or is this the foil to this situation? That, that doesn't really... There you go. doesn't I, really work. It, it looks some of the most successful authors. Uh, Stephen King. Yeah. His wife is his, the first set of eyes that sees a book when he's done writing it. That's cool. And she goes through and mm-hmm. she goes and, and does... She's, her, she's his editor, essentially. Or yeah. at, least, at least his first run editor. Yeah. Um, you just need another set of eyes on your on your story, your book, because yeah. you wrote it, you can't see what's missing because yeah. your brain will fill that in. Absolutely. Automatically as you're reading it, mm-hmm. missing word or a typo or this or, or oh, well, this is the story. Oh, well, you didn't, you don't realize you've missed an entire, you know, subplot that you started here and never finished. Right. You never you pick know. it up again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that's, that's why now another set of eyes at the very minimum. <laughs> yeah, is, is really good. And uh, to be able, oh boy, so now, boy, we're just getting into this is the <laughs> why we love editors one on one. Um, I always feel like there are two two steps if someone is is going to self publish, or mm-hmm. even if they're even if they're they're ready to publish. Yeah, is that yeah have that other set of eyes and also have a good set of ears on yourself. Mm-hmm. So often, uh, a a friend who is not published with us who, who wants to go the self-publishing route will say, will you just be a set of eyes for me? And I'm like, okay, well, first of all, that's a little bit disrespectful. I understand that you're trying to connect with me like on a friendship level, but you know, this is what I do for a living. So yeah, this yeah. is not enjoyable to me, <laughs> but, and when I do, and then we sit down and you were talking and it's the, the arguing. And I'm always like, if someone is still arguing with the editor, 
then you're not really ready to let go. You're not really ready to go, oh, oh shoot, readers are not gonna understand yeah. that ResTap is silly, but he's got a heart of gold. Yeah. Because I know what happens with ResTap Three books, books down the line. I know what his backstory is, and or you know you say, well, but that character is me. How can you not like me? You know, or something like that. And mm-hmm. I always say, yeah, you need an editor with a, and again, like you said, it's almost like a pre-editor. Yeah. Your first run editor, you need an editor with a good set of eyes, and then you need that editor to be able to come to you, and you need to have a good set of ears. I'm like, that's there's a balance there. I think there may be a way, the path to growth to get there. Yeah. Is a writing group. Oh, there you go. Because an they're honest going to writing do, group? An honest writing group. Yes. Yes. Because they're going to go, they're going to be brutal, <laughs> but they're going to be honest. Yeah. From their perspective. Yes. Now, not everything they tell you is going to be on, on spot, but if three out of four there. tell you the same thing. Love that. Probably something you need to look at. Absolutely. And yeah. people are going to hate me for saying this because especially right now, anytime I tell people to do something digitally or online, they're like, yeah. I want to get together and I'm like yes we all do yes, yes. we all miss each other <laughs> yes 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 fine but I always say yeah. for me one of the best um, uh, for- formats yeah. uh, approaches for a writers group is over the net because then it's not Jennifer and Lauren agree that ResTap is too silly you know but Suzette doesn't agree but you know there's a oh I agree with that yeah. I feel like if you're passing manuscripts around and everyone is sending feedback directly to the author, mm-hmm. they're not seeing each other's feedback. Right. So I feel like then it's not influenced. There's no mob mentality, which I don't mean that. I think that sometimes mob mentality happens unintentionally, kind of jumping right. on the bandwagon of, oh, yeah, too much silliness, or, oh, yeah, I kind of saw that too. And I'm like, you don't kind of see something. Yeah. You either see it or you don't see it here. And I feel like that's where I always get the absolute most honest feedback is when it is one reader talking to me about a work and then the same work reader number two reader number three reader number four and you're absolutely right even if i don't agree with something if four out of five readers are like jennifer this character is not likable yeah then i look at how can i make this character more relatable Mm -hmm. how can i make this character more accessible to my reader so that they have empathy for this character oh yeah but I'm I'm sure that that dynamic can can exist in person. <laughs> I just yes. haven't found it yet. I had um, a, a, I found a great writing group uh, yeah. in Houston. Mm-hmm. When I lived there. We met at a Barnes and Noble. They had a back room, so that you'd actually go in the back room. You close the door. Back in the day. All that, back in the day. Yeah. Because yeah. eventually we couldn't go there anymore. Right. Uh, but there were writers of all different uh, experience levels. All different interests, you know. Mm-hmm. We had one who was into uh, Christian, you know, stories and writing and that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm-hmm. We had somebody who was a, a, a historical fiction, and yeah. somebody who did this. Uh, they were all different genres, and we'd all get together and we critique each other's work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we so we'd be critiquing it not from a fan point of view, but from a a story point of view. Uh, yeah. you know, and and for me that was that was more of the honest feedback. Mm-hmm. Um, they didn't have to like the story, but no. but they could tell me what needed to change in the story. Mm-hmm. To make it even uh, stronger. Yeah. We're not competing. Yeah. We all have our own stories to tell. People yeah. read voraciously. <laughs> they, it, it's not like people are going to only buy from one. It just yeah. It doesn't... Yeah. Okay, well, that, see, that gives me hope. So it was, it was, it was interesting. Mm-hmm. So... Um, uh, Eventually, um, in my mind anyway, I outgrew the writing group, mm-hmm. uh, that, that situation. Um, but um, I think that's important, and that was an important step early on to get that feedback so I could understand how to better tell a story. And yes. once I'd gotten that locked down, okay, I got that, mm-hmm. then I'm on to the next level of, of perhaps writing the book and sending it to publishers mm-hmm. and seeing what I can have done with it. Um, that's that's just one step. I mean, the the current thing, uh, a lot of published authors have uh, um, readers, mm-hmm. so they'll write their book, and before they publish it, they'll send it off to their yeah their readers. Yes, uh, super fans. Yeah, super fans or whatever. You know, people mm-hmm. who have they're dedicated. 
and, and want to read that and we'll give them feedback. It's like, well, you forgot yeah. this character or you forgot to do this or so on and so forth. You Especially know? if you're in a series. Yes. You, sometimes your super fans can know your world better, better than, than you, you do. do. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so that's that's an interesting step, which I have not, I have not gone there. Mm-hmm. I don't, I, I don't know if it's a... Uh, well, you're giving up control when you yeah, do that. Yeah, you do give up control mm-hmm. when you do that, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, to yeah. some level, yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, I, I haven't figured out the, the, the mechanics of how I go and reach out to... Because I haven't heard from, I've heard from one reader... Of from of Rest Hat. Yeah. And that was because she was reading it as we were on the conference floor and I was selling books and she bought one and she was my fellow, she was occupying the booth right next to me. Yeah. And so she was laughing out loud at Mishaps and Mayhem as she was reading it. Oh, I love that. Uh, but that's the only person I've got right. feedback on. Yes. So, I mean, I've got, you know, there's some reviews in mm-hmm. Amazon, mm-hmm. Uh, which are great. So hard to come by. <laughs> yes. Give readers, give authors you like reviews on Amazon. And this is not the first time you guys are hearing that on Speak either. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is. It's, it's, um, that can be very disheartening. And I always say, yeah. you know, the, the review doesn't have to be glowing. Yeah. I think there's also a lot of pressure. You know, people think they need to, so again, I'm going to date myself. They, they feel like they need to sound like, um, something out of a historic episode of Siskel and Ebert. <laughs> um, it's, you don't have to have this glossy, no. fancy language. Just say, what did you think of the book? Yeah. This yeah. is what I thought of the book. What'd you like about it? What yeah. did you like about it? Absolutely. And it doesn't Nothing. have to be a five yeah. out of five star rating. You know, it mm-hmm. can be any rating you want. You know, bad reviews also sell books. I mean, yeah. I hate to say that, but it is true. Yeah. Especially if you say why you didn't like it. Because someone mm-hmm. else might like a book specifically for that reason. Yep. Um, and then I think the other thing that I always throw out is it's... I don't find it a valid review to say, I found a typo on page 14. Talk about the freaking story. <laughs> yes. I mean, yeah. unless it's, I, I'm i on chapter two and found 127 <laughs> errors. I mean, I think that's valid. Yes, that was valid. That was but valid. I mean, you know, this, I'm like, please, I read mainstream hardback books that I drop 29 bucks on, and I'm like, page five, glaring typographical error. And I'm like, I'm not going to include that in my Amazon review. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to review the book that the author intended to write. Mm-hmm. Not a typo that may not even have been made by the author. Mm-hmm. But, okay. <laughs> so I know, we, we keep kind of veering into ResTab, and I, I, I know that that hasn't been... I have a longer history with ResTab than I do with the You do! Books, you, so. and I had longer than yes. I even knew, which I yes. love. I have loved that about these interviews, is that there have been times when my jaw has dropped to my lap, yeah. and I'm like, a kid in seventh yeah. grade? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Hang on, let me completely rewire the way I think about this. Uh, in From the Shadows, but I yes. feel like also in Dissidence Junction, mm-hmm. you explore some pretty dark themes. Yeah. And I don't want to say why. I mean, you know, it, why does a writer write anything? Right. You know, but do you feel it's important? Do you feel that we should? You know, some people say, well, yeah. why? Why? You know, yeah. it, why do you have to fictionalize this? You know, don't we see enough of this? Uh, you know, we do see a lot of it. Mm-hmm. And I think people will sweep it under the rug. And I think maybe stories like this bring that back out. Oh, did this really happen? Or does thing do things like this really happen? Yeah. Um, I think uh, in the in the history of monsters, I've, I'm wearing a classic monster yeah. uh, T-shirt. Um, invariably, we find that the worst monster in the story are the humans. Yeah. Uh, and that is true a lot in life. And so that's, uh, you know, I just throw it out there. I had a, 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 a script I wrote that had a, a bad guy, mm-hmm. you know, corporate head who, you know, did some horrible things. Yeah. Um, my filmmaking uh, partner uh, objected. He said, oh, nobody in real life is that bad. And I was like, oh, oh sir. How delightful. I would like to live in oh, that sir. world in your let, mind. Let, yeah. me, let me expound upon things yeah. I've literally experienced that are worse than this guy. Yeah. Um and and, and he had to he had to yeah, so, okay, I got it. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, you're right. Mm-hmm. Um but I mean the bad guys, you know, the bad guys in life, I mean I I would say you've got people in here, you know, killing people or hurting people or whatnot, and there are way worse people in real life. Than anything I write about in here. Yeah. Uh, which is, 
it's crazy to think about because there's some horrible things that happen in here. But it's, but it's, it's, true. it's true. Yeah. It's true. I mean, uh, people pay up. You know, you got Holocaust deniers and and, and you, you say, well, nothing like that could happen. I was like, well, Rwanda, uh, a Darfur. I mean, I, it, yeah, there's a list here. It, 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 it's continues. It's to not happen. a one off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, humans are horrible to humans. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I think yeah. uh, people often talk about The Walking Dead as if they were the first sci fi, the first dystopian oh, to yeah. do this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, the zombies are not the scariest thing. Yeah, <laughs> it's the it's the other humans. Right. It's the it's the militias that's ri- that rise up. It's just the the leaders that rise up mm-hmm. and that are like, oh, okay, this is my chance to take power. This yeah. is my chance to seize what I've always wanted, and by any means, because law is thrown to the wind. Right. And I yeah, I mean, it's scary yeah. to consider it, but I think it's true, and I think that's mm-hmm. what makes for good horror mm-hmm. is when we're like, wow. Yeah. Oh, this could oh this could happen. Yeah. <laughs> or, you know, ooh, a, a sliver of this has happened. This is yes. out of headlines. This yes. is interesting. Hmm, I like that. <laughs> what are you going to read for us today? For, from which book? From the Shadows. Okay, from the Shadows. Now, bring it up here. Going yeah. back to Amazon. At Amazon, it's called Look Inside the Book. Uh-huh. But then in, you and I have talked about walking into bricks and mortar stores. You know, you, mm-hmm. you pick them up, you maybe flip through them. You know, I've had folks fight me a little bit. Like, I've never picked up a book and just randomly read in it. And I'm like, really? You don't want to know if it's in first person, third person, what the basic style is, even if it's you're purposely only reading the first page. Mm-hmm. That idea of look inside the book, I thought that was brilliant on Amazon's yeah. part. You know, again, I think they had to say, okay, what can a, a bricks and I almost said it real world. What can a bricks and mortar store give someone that we're not doing yet? And then, oh, right. okay, look inside the book. Mm-hmm. So you have decided to read. I'm reading from. <clears throat> Uh, oh, yeah, sure. It doesn't tell me the title of the story. Hang on. Uh, Crawleys. Okay. Crawleys is the, uh, it's like a creature horror story. All right. Uh, Felix climbed into his car and drove away from the mansion at top speed. The nearest neighbors were nearly a mile away. When he cleared the front gate, the basement collapsed and the building behind him exploded. In the rearview mirror, he watched as the skeleton frame of the building, engulfed in flames, struggled to stay standing. Felix scratched his head. Dang dandruff, he said, as he continued down the road. The itching in his scalp intensified to a pain. The pain traveled down his neck. He looked at his hand as it began to scratch too. He recognized the red skin irritation. Shit. Felix turned the car around. He called Melanie's phone. It rang until the voicemail answered. Of course, she was still asleep after a long night. No one else he could turn to. No time. Melanie, this is Felix. I've made a terrible mistake, Felix said. He gritted his teeth as the pain in his skull increased. Focusing on the pain, Felix kept his car on the road and barreled toward his burning home. He gave Melanie the details on how to access his digital records in the cloud. I ha- it's normally now I shake your hand and I say thank you for coming. Mm-hmm. But I have to pull out two things. One, your vaccine card is your bookmark. Yes. <laughs> and I love you so much for that. <laughs> like I can't even begin to say. Um, and the other thing is... Because I know that Brienne will not forgive me if I don't bring this up. Mm. On the back of the book, she does have, actually, a pull tag about revenge. Mm -hmm. It's funny because, again, I have not read From the Shadows, but I have read Dissident's Junction. Okay. And revenge, it's a theme that you revisit. Mm -hmm. Why? Um... At the very basic level of humanity, yeah, you want to get back at that person who wronged you. Society has said, no, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> and in a functioning society, we don't, for the most part, get revenge on someone who has wronged us. Mm-hmm. Sometimes we point it out and say, hey, 
don't do that again. Yeah. But we don't go back and get revenge. But everybody wants to. <laughs> so that's that's kind of the cathartic. Uh, to find a fairness, thing. a balance, to, yeah. to rebalance the scales. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I've had, had horrible things happen to me in my past. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I've definitely thought, well, that person needs to suffer <laughs> as much as they've made me suffer. Uh, but I haven't, you know, I haven't gone back to that. Yeah. Now, the nice thing about writing is yes. you can put that character in a story and you can do some horrible things to him. And that's a wonderful <laughs> revenge in and of itself. It sure is. You know, like, really, thank you for that creative meat. That's right. You know, I can really sink my teeth into that. That's right. Lauren, thank you for coming today to speak. You're and this has been fantastic. Again, it's Lauren Patzer and Artemis Withers. And, you know, Lauren's got little tinies, and he's got comedy, and he has some of the best horror that I have read, and I like horror. So there we go. So now I can't wait to read From the Shadows. So thank you, Lauren. You are welcome. We often return to this theme of writing as a therapeutic source. Whether it's a revenge you'll never have, or maybe a revenge you should never have, or healing from a trauma or creating the work that you yourself wanted, your younger self wanted, writing can have incredible, healing, positive, lasting, transformative effects. Sometimes a story just gives us escapism, but sometimes it's so much more than that. Reading something that can be visceral, that can take hold of us and shake something loose. I think that with Lauren's work, what we're shaking loose isn't always bright and shiny, but it is always valuable. Because something doesn't have to be bright and shiny to be worthwhile and to be part of us. Sometimes some of the most important parts of us are those parts that are darker and maybe a little harder to look at. Thank you for joining us today for Speak. Speak was brought to you by the 501c3 Blue Legacy and made possible in part by grants from the National Endowment for the Arts and the Washington Arts Commission. If you'd like to be a guest on Speak or if you have a question that you'd like us to ask future guests, please write to us at blueforgefilms at gmail.com.